Hello everyone, you welcome to this edition of the Inside on Equinox Television. I am Babla Jonathan. In this edition of the program, we're going to take a critical look at the atrocities being committed in the crisis hit anglophone regions of the Republic of Cameroon, the Northwest and the Southwest regions. The socio-political and security crisis has been deepening for close to uh, three years today and we are receiving in this edition of the program three eminent men of God who have the ears and eyes on the ground across the region taking a look at what is happening and we are going to receive first the Archbishop Emeritus of the Bamenda Archdiocese of the Roman Catholic Church his grace Cornelius Fontaine Eswo you welcome to the program thank you very much first of all we want to look at your 37 years of service to the church and humanity Saturday you handed over your baton of command to the new Archbishop of Bamenda, His Grace Andrew uh, uh, Nkia, who was formerly the Bishop of Manfi in the southwest region of the country. How has it been 37 years of service to the church and humanity? Well, it has been a wonderful time, a fulfilling time. And uh, when I look back at the seven, 37 years, I can only thank God. I thank God first because He's given me the good health. You know, my health is not, has not been very, very good. But uh, I think uh, His grace has uh, sustained me all these years. And uh, quite a lot has happened. I was first the Bishop of uh, Kumbu, uh, where I was for as bishop 22 years and i was apostolic administrator for one and a half years i came to kumbu 1982 and uh, i left in uh, 2006 in 2004 that is before i left kumbu i was appointed apostolic minister uh, i was appointed the uh, coadjutor archbishop of bamenda so for one and a half years i was coming to bamenda i was living in bamenda and going up and down to Kumbo and back and uh, it's soon a year when I fully took over from the uh, Archbishop, the Archbishop Emeritus, uh, it was uh, also a more a heavier program because I had to administer the two dioceses and uh, since then uh, we have been trying to do our best in order to keep the faith going and to carry on the work of evangelization. What are some of the major challenges that you have faced for 37 years, within the 37 years of service to the church and humanity? As I said, um, the basic work of the church is to proclaim the good news, to carry out the work of evangelization. And that work of evangelization uh, takes care of the social welfare of the people, the spiritual welfare of people. We deal with things of justice and peace. Uh, we deal of the development of the people, the health of the people. Because uh, Jesus Christ came, Jesus Christ, the Son of God came, that we may have life and have it to the full. And so the church carries out every aspect of uh, activity that will help the human person to be fully human and to live a uh, life according to the, the will of God. And so within these years, uh, my challenges have been, for example, education, making sure that we have our Catholic schools, our Catholic schools run properly, and the many more schools we have created. And uh, especially one of the challenges with the pain of the teachers, you know, the, uh, the government subvention was uh, diminishing and actually uh, very often not given at all and practically very little is given now and so our teachers have been going without pay especially during this particular period where the schools are all shut down whereas the government teachers are receiving pay our teachers are not receiving pay so that is one of the challenges another challenge would have is all issues of justice and peace the look socio uh, socio-political situation that we have been living through and it's, uh, you know, as uh, somebody who takes care of the people of God, uh, you cannot pretend, you know, the church is uh, the, the voice of the, of, the, of the poor, the voice of the voiceless. And so issues like that, the church is preoccupied 
because it's concerned about the questions of justice, the questions of peace, the questions of, uh, you know, full development of the people. And so, the church has been badly affected by this crisis uh, yes, with uh, congregations has, that have been shut down, yes, schools that have not been functioning for the, for the past last, three years. Yes, last three years, a uh, number of uh, parishes have practically not functioning. A few are functioning around, uh, downtown here. An estimate uh, of the number of uh, parishes and schools? We, that we have in this archdiocese about uh, one parish does not function at all. The other parishes are just functioning, you know, like Batibo, you know, Widikum, Teze, uh, Yemge, Esu, Menka, you know, Bamesing, uh, even Bafut, you know, where it is just impossible, you know, when the people are living uh, in a difficult a situation of insecurity. You know, they are sandwiched between the military and the Amber Boys, and they cannot move. Uh, when the church comes, then the people can breathe a little bit. All right, we'll, we'll yes. talk about that in yes. greater details okay. in a short while. Fine. Uh, after 37 years of uh, service, described as 37 years of humble, successful, and faithful service to the church and man, you were handing over the baton of command Saturday. Yes. I How did. did you feel about uh, th at this moment of I handing over after your, moment, uh, after your retirement according to canon law? Yes. I feel fully satisfied. I feel happy because I'm handing over to a younger person who would ca carry on the work who, uh, in these present circumstances. And uh, I, fully, I feel, as I, would, I said, uh, fulfilled because I've lived my life as a bishop fully and I've tried to do everything I have to do, proclaim the gospel in and out of season, as St. Paul you know, calls us all to do. In other words, in difficult and uh, easy times. Uh, the past three years have been particularly difficult because our parishes are not functional, you cannot even visit, you are blocked, the roads are blocked, and um, then you get in, all the villages have been destroyed, uh, houses burned down, the schools cannot function. Our you know, Christians, if they want to have their children go to school, they have to get out of Bamenda. The mass exodus that is taking place now of the uh, Northwesterners or just at the Southwesterners to Douala, to Yaounde, to Bafusam, you know, to all these other places depletes our whole uh, structure. You, the parishes cannot function any longer. I went to Teze, and the chairperson of the parish pastoral council of Teze lives in Bamenda, with internal displacement of the people. You know, even here, you know, people in the suburbs, in the you know, in the rural areas, you know, uh, they, they, they cannot live there. They all come to Bamenda here. So most of those parishes outside Bamenda are not functioning properly. But one thing I have done, and uh, is that I ask the priests to be there. They are there, they are a sign of hope for the people, they are suffering with the people, the people have the courage to say, they are a sign that God is in their midst, and with God in their midst, nothing can be against them. Uh, the, 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 there, there are lots of allegations of uh, an unclear and um, too closed relationship between the church, the Roman Catholic Church, and the administration. Today we saw the Minister of Territorial Administration at Tanganji Paul during the uh, ceremony here in Bamenda. And have you um, been influenced at a given point in time during your 37 years of service by administrative authorities? Have you received some kind of influence or pressure? Well, uh, a day like this is actually not supposed to be the yardstick because uh, many people are coming together the uh, people are invited, the governors, the ministers are invited for the Christians. They are Christians, even if they were not Christians. Uh, they, no, that is a social event that involves them as well. 
So uh, you cannot but uh, invite them. You cannot but be part of. The, uh, you cannot but be part of the organization. So that one I uh, really would not bother me to say somebody saying that because they are part of this celebration. Therefore, it's normal we for are them with to them. be there. Yeah, it's normal for them Christians, for Christians, the first of all. Yes, Christians. And then as many of them are Catholics. Can... Yes, and so they come. And even if they were not Christians, for example, if the governor, uh, like as we had some time, were a Muslim, he would be here because of his role as a governor all right uh, out, of that, a, a, out of that out of that away from that yes for the four decades of yes. your service so, of church and to man have what you at every at any given point in time felt some pressure for one reason of course or the other to say of one course. thing or the other of to course. do one thing or yes. the other uh, in the situation like this and uh, even in other situations there are cases that uh, the the government want the church to, to support what we are doing and uh, I, I tell them I support them as long as it is morally good as long as it is for the service of the people and so there have been times that I've disagreed with them and we are the agree to disagree and I tell them that uh, no it is not right I mean we wrote a memorandum when the situation started and in our memorandum, we analyzed you know, the situation that we are living on the ground, at the grassroots. We stand a better chance. I think no governor, no SDO has been to places that I've been and have lived the situation of the people the way I live. And so I can say that I have a more realistic you know, view of the situation, of the situation. On the ground. and as and I so, indicated earlier that your you, ears and your eyes uh, yes, yes. have been on the ground have been on the ground right across from the beginning the, the, the northwest region of northwest, the country northwest and even the southwest mm. because we the bishops of this ecclesiastical province we meet together very regularly we have our provincial bishops conference and when we meet together we evaluate the situation the social situation of our, of our, of our, uh, of our diocese. We find out what is happening about issues of uh, works of evangelization or particular problems like this particular situation and how the church is trying to find its way. So His uh, Grace, Cornelius Fontem Eswa, yeah. what is the situation on the ground today in the well, northwest and in the southwest regions of the country is it improving as the, as the authorities have been saying uh, is it deteriorating we have we, we've been having lots of uh, atrocities being committed within these few uh, months of well, 2020 I, I think the impression is given that the situation is improving but i want to tell you that uh, from what i know and from the experiences that i know the situation is not improving. I mean, it, you can certainly better now, you know, to drive, you know, to Bafusama and back. But you have ghost town days, and not only ghost town days, you have situations where you have confrontation every day between the military and the Amber Boys. I've been caught in a number of them myself. The military is par uh, parading everywhere and even a few days ago just before this celebration i was stopped in town here by the military that was preventing me from going to carry out my pastoral responsibilities it was not easy to convince them and i can imagine what happens to the uh, to the simple people and i think it's a very difficult situation to live and work in his grace cornelius von temesua who is doing what in the northwest, in the southwest regions of the country, as far as those atrocities that you're mentioning are concerned? Well, if you say who is doing what, you have to look at it from the point of view of the protagonists. You have the Amber Boys, you have those who are not satisfied with the status quo. And they have been expressing this for the last four years and beyond. And they are the thing that their questions have not been answered, even with the national dialogue. Because those of them who are on the ground, who deserve to be talked to, 
who uh, actually those who are the real protagonists. They were not part of the national dialogue. And so they are carrying out their own thing. And uh, the government is on the other side of it. They say they are peacekeeping force. There is no peacekeeping force here. Because what they, they? Uh, what they do is that they get into the villages, they are looking for the boys, and everybody is a culprit. Or the boys you now confront them and they run away and the rest of the population suffers. I mean, I have my churches with bullets. I have the father's houses with bullets. Oh. With some uh, places I we cannot open them. We cannot even pass there. It's not because of the boys, it's because of the military. No. It's because of the military. Because the military takes everybody as a criminal. That is not how to solve this problem. The military should not take everybody as a criminal. We can say that that people. But what is the consequence of that? The consequence taking everybody of that, that as a criminal. Uh, yeah, taking everybody is uh, that uh, you call the, that gives rise to wholesale, you no, know, call it wholesale maltreatment of the people, torturing of the people, you know, and everybody is a suspect and you are not given the chance even to tell who you are. And I've had an incident besides in two incidents here in downtown in a hospital where somebody, you know, who left the hospital, you know, was caught by the military and he was asked to lie down and the military shot him down in front of the sisters, in front of the doctors without even questioning who he was. Even if he was a criminal, that's not how to carry out an act like that. You know, I think there are a system that is foreign to our mentality. You should be held, you know, not guilty until you are proved guilty. And, and, and I think that's the Anglophone problem. His Grace, what, do you, what information do you have at your disposal concerning the houses that have been burnt down every day in places like Balignonga and oh, other parts Balignonga, of the two regions. Uh, yes. Several houses burnt yeah, down. My, my priest That's gives all. me all the information. And when it happened in Balignonga, I mean, people ran into the mission, they slept there. And the priest had to give them accommodation. And the markets and everything were burnt down. You know? And it happened here in uh, going up to the to uh, to the airport and that is what happened there and the houses were all burnt down you know and it has happened in a lot many places and you ask yourself even if you are looking for criminals why burn down houses people have been left homeless and it would take them time these are the amber boys those who have been, you know, they can have nowhere else to go. I was taken by the Amber Boys because the position of the church is that we are neutral. And we are neither for the government nor for uh, the Amber Boys. And we tell them that. And we tell them no violence, no killing. That's God's law. That shall not kill. Whether it is the military or it is the Amber Boys. And we stick to that. And I have been addressing the Amber Boys and said, look, even if you are fighting for justice, you should give people a chance. You know? And some of them do listen to me. Some do not listen to me. It's by the Amber Boys. The houses were burnt by the military. How do you solve a problem like that? Like in many other cases, when we have wholesale burning, it is burnt by the military. And the government says that the military is there to protect the people, and to protect that is the paradox. integrity that is a paradox of, of, of the country. Yes, and that so. is the paradox that we are living in. That is the paradox. So, in order to solve this problem, we have to break the vicious circle. And that's why we call for total amnesty. Total amnesty. Let the military go back to the barracks. And we tell the Amber boys to put down their arms. 
But I think the Amber boys will not put their, their arms if the military are not in the barracks. His Lordship, do you, do you have an estimate of the number of people who have been killed, the number of villages burnt down I, in the I don't, I don't have it, but my service has that. Uh, I can always get that information from you, for you, because we have the justice and peace, uh, you have the characters that uh, gives me report. And I tell them, we summarize those reports and we have them for documentation. Right. Yes. Um, Lordship, before we, we, we go, what should be, what is that medicine that should be administered to seek Cameroon, to the patient Cameroon, to take the country out of the troubled waters? I think the first thing we need genuine dialogue. And the truth must be spoken. What took place was not genuine? Yeah. The dialogue that took place well, in the Well, I was part of it. And I was in a commission. And from the discussions that took place there, I think we were not addressing the issue. We were not addressing the issue. I was in the, uh, the commission for decentralization. They were talking about local councils and when you, others. When you say when the, the, the dialogue was not addressing the issues, yes. does that mean the outcome do not reflect the aspirations of no, the people? No, no, the issues were, they were taboo questions. They could not discuss anything that was out of the program that was set by the government. And I do remember somebody asked a question about, uh, you know, uh, the form of government, and that was a taboo question. Uh, can you imagine a national dialogue that is trying to address the issue of the Anglophone problem, and the basic Anglophone problem is the form of government, education, and the legal system. That is how it all started. It started with the strike of the teachers started with the strike of the lawyers and everybody is disgruntled about how we are being administered. One of the major outcomes that will change the manner in which the two Anglophone regions of the country uh, will be administered henceforth is the spatial status. What do you think about that? Can it solve any the sp spatial status was in the constitution since 1996. And that constitution was written after the all Anglophone conferences, after the problem started. After 25 years, what has happened? You think it would happen now? I don't think so. Secondly, the so-called uh, special status, we are thinking within a box. And that box is the centralized system. I think the Anglophone problem will be solved when we get out of the centralized system and look at other alternatives as far as the organization of the country and the government is concerned. You said the truth should be spoken. Yes. What's that truth that should be spoken? The truth be spoken. We have not addressed that issue. All right. There's another option. Yes. That some uh, Cameroonians of, from the Northwest and Southwest regions are uh, holding to. Yes. They call it let my people go. That is, Those if the UN, for example, was to come in, like yes. somebody like Barista uh, Akuiya Joseph proposes and yes. organizes a referendum, and yes. the people say we don't want to be part of this country anymore, they should be, let, they should be allowed to go. Well, uh, I believe that uh, Cameroon has a history. Cameroon is a, was one country with the Germans. And when the Germans lost the war, Cameroon was divided into two. We had the uh, Anglophones or under a trusted territory, under the English and the French. And we grew up in that system from to, uh, 1920, more or less 1918, about uh, you know the treaties of Versailles. No, that's split Cameroon. Excuse my, my knowledge of history may not be that, but I would need to get that right. 
But right up to 1960, we had lived as two separate countries with two separate traditions, ways of government, language, system of law. Now, we come together and we agreed that in order to, we have to preserve our two systems, our two heritages, in other words, the Francophone and Anglophone heritage. I mean, I and we, we went in for federalism. I believe that federalism is, I would say, the least we can receive in order to solve the Anglophone problem. I do not uh, uh, agree with those who want the separatists, those of the separatists. In our memorandum, we have tried to analyze that. We have tried to analyze the various options and the various opinions, you know. And if you are asking my personal opinion, my personal opinion to keep Cameroon one must be divisible. Because it's a cliche that Cameroon is one and invisible. Because it's not true. Culturally, we were divisible. Language wise, we were divisible. The law wise, we have inherited that. So, anybody who says Cameroon is one and indivisible is a fallacy. And so, we would have to handle that issue very squarely and objectively. And that's what I call the truth. The truth must prevail. There is no doubt that there are people of both sides you know, that cherish their heritage. And the only way of keeping Cameroon together is to respect the respective heritages. That we do have. His Grace Cornelius Fontem is who as Archbishop Emeritus of the Bamenda Archdiocese of the Roman Catholic Church. Thanks for accepting to be with us in this edition of the program. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks, ladies and gentlemen, for staying with us. Meet our second guest in some few seconds. Thanks, dear viewers, for staying with us. We are receiving. His Lordship George Ko, he is the Bishop of Kumbu in the Dongamantum Division, Northwest region of the Republic of Cameroon. His Lordship, you're welcome. Thank you very much. You took part in the uh, ceremony uh, Saturday where the Archbishop Emeritus of the Bamenda Archdiocese, His Lordship or His Grace Cornelius Fontem is who handed over the baton of command to his successor. His Grace uh, Andrew Kia from the southwest region of the country. What's your take on this handing over? Well, traditionally, that happens in the church when a bishop reaches the retirement age of 75. He applies to the Holy Father that it's time for him to resign, and the Holy Father gives him a retirement notice and he goes. And a new, a new, a new, a new bishop or new archbishop is put in place. That is exactly what happened. And um, we are familiar with that, uh, the, although it comes with, it, with all its own, you know, interesting uh, ramifications. But we are very happy, and uh, today's ceremony was a beautiful occasion for us to see the transition. And especially, we we'll see that uh, one generation actually is handing over to another generation that takes on the baton of leadership in the church, and it's the, very significant. The older generation handing over to the younger generation. I, I can say that as well, very much so. Uh, people who were formed within a certain generation in the priesthood and in the episcopacy, they were like the pioneer bishops that we've had, handing over to another generation of bishops who have had experience, who have been groomed, who have been prepared, and bringing fresh freshness and new life into the church. And a beautiful experience for us to, to live through. All right, uh, His Lordship, you were talking about the impact of the crisis on the, the, the Christians, church attendance, mm -hmm. on the, the, the people, globally speaking, in the two re uh, divisions that make up the Kumbu Diocese yeah, of the Roman yeah, Catholic Church. Yeah. Yes, uh, I can say that there has been a massive exodus. Lots and lots of our people have had to leave Kumbu for security reasons and also for purposes to continue their businesses but also because they want to have their children to school because in the last three four years our schools have been completely locked down so children have not been able to go to school so practically more than half of the population in these two in these two divisions have moved some of them are relocated to nigeria some of them have moved into other parts of the of the, of the country in search of education of the future of something to do and it's remarkable particularly with school there were thousands and 
thousands of children who could go to school. There has been no school in Congo, so the children have had to move. And I was mentioning that uh, the situation has not completely normalized. But the, I, I, I want to use this opportunity to a, clear, a clarion call to the people that Kumbo has to be rebuilt. People have to come back and life must go on. Whatever the issues are, it's important for us at this stage to take the bull by the horn and say, now we can look for other avenues to resolve our issues, but certain things are non, uh, are, are non negotiable. The future of a children, four years without school, I see them, I move around with them, I see them in the parishes. And it's a lamentable situation. And the I'm future of the children should it's, not be compromised. Heavily jeopardized, heavily jeopardized. And um, uh, but, but but of course the circumstances are not very very suitable. There's fear. There is also no guarantee that when the children come, they can have the opportunity to go to school. But we are very very concerned about that. On the 14th of February, 2020, one of the deadliest incidents for this year, as far as this year is concerned, hit a locality in your diocese, Garbo. And there are lots of versions of what happened there. The government has its own version, the military fighting with separatist fighters and the presence of um, some kind of uh, containers filled with uh, fuel that generated the fire that burnt the houses and so on and so forth. And the deal of Ndu has his own version, uh, pointing, accusing fingers to the separatist fighters. You have been on the ground with the, your eight, the people who are working with you in the diocese, and they have been doing some fact-finding uh, in the area. What actually happens there? Well, as far as, as far as I know, and listening to the people who give testimonies who are on the ground and people who are sent to the ground, uh, first of all, about, let's talk about numbers. Um, there has been a, 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 a confusion of figures. of figures. Now I have very clearly figures that I can say these are the number of people that I have their names and their ages who have died. There I have a list of 22 people who have actually whose names are on the list and who have actually died. And about seven or eight of them are children. Two are pregnant women. That's the fact. And it's irrefutable because we have their names and so on. Uh, the, uh, the other details I, 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 cannot, I cannot completely tell you, but I can also say from the story that the, the people on the ground have reported to us that, that morning, about 4.30 in the morning, some houses were knocked at the door, broken into, looking, they were looking, the, 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 the military people were looking for the Amber Boys, call it call the name of that we know. And they got some people and uh, in the process of it, houses were burnt, people were killed, and there were no amber boys apparently maybe in fact on my list there's one name which says an amber boy that was killed but that definitely all the people that were killed were not amber boys uh, that that's as much as as we can say but you we know that when this happened a lot of the people evacuated the the, the village they moved, some of them moved into town to some of them gone down to to Mbanzon, where you guys are in Gensen and to the villages where, where the people are at the moment and we are we are reaching them from both sides because our parishes are, are located within these two villages and we are well, still coming up with details as to you know people can give you clear first hand evidence testimony from what you see in his lordship it can be concluded that the massacre was committed by the military is that from the testimony that I've gotten from the people and they can call names this mama said this happened somebody knocked at her door took her children her children and her husband out to the road and later on they saw that the neighbor was killed with everybody in the house that's the testimony and they said, when the army came they were asking for where are the boys this is a testimony I'm giving I'm recounting what an eyewitness has told us I, I cannot say it otherwise mm. but this is the fact All right the, the, the government has its own figure, five. Four children, one woman. What, what do you think about uh, those maybe, maybe the government has not done enough findings, but I am giving you information that I have sent people to the ground. And this is, they, I have the names. I have the ages of the people who have died. Their names are the children. Their ages and the names are all there. And they can produce the names. They can produce the names at any time, if they want them. There's no, there's no dispute about names and people. The names are there and the ages are there. We have those facts. All right. As a servant of the church, a servant of humanity, a servant of God, what do you think about this 
playing on figures two five twenty is this person who did this this person who did this playing over human life I, i'm happy you say as a servant of god I, I i i they can play on the figures but what remains is the fact is that human life has been lost most brutally most recklessly whatever the mistakes made human life if it is one person it is two people it is 22 people life has been lost and it is not to be taken as a joke and i know that this is a situation where so many lives have been lost and this particular incident is most striking because there are young innocent children five seven eight nine years old children that i was in kumo yesterday i celebrated mass and you see the crowd of children who came out to mourn the mass in honor of the victims of the victims of the yes yes the, 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 the presence of the children who have not been going to school came out massively with candles and the names of some of the children of their friends who were murdered who were killed who were recklessly killed I, I want to say that maybe this is an opportunity to say that uh, let, 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 let that be a, a halt to this genocide, or I don't call it genocide, or killing of people just because uh, they are looking for, if they are looking for amber boys, what, but the professionalism requires that you actually kill the person that you know or you bring the person to justice that you know has committed a crime, but to be reckless and to kill people and innocent children. That's why the world is crying out, because they were innocent little children, along some of them with their parents. That is cruel. That is why we must speak about it. And it's evil. Whoever is involved, whoever. We have had the situation during this, this crisis that uh, on both sides, human life has been lost and there's no reason for that whatsoever. All right, His Lordship, when you talk to the families, the bereaved families, what are they saying? What have they been telling you? Uh, well, uh, to be honest with you, I've not talked directly with them, but I've talked to my people on the field, on the ground, who have actually met them and I will hope to meet them next week when I go down there myself and um, they, they were traumatized I remember one of them one of, one of my workers telling me very clearly when this mama started talking about her sister-in-law who was killed along with the children she was so overwhelmed that she just wept, wept. so she just wept and she it burst it, into tears yes I have met people who are related to people who have died and, and, and they recount the stories with great pain, great pain, that this, this cannot happen to Ngarbu, and why Ngarbu, and how Ngarbu. And uh, it's, it's, it's true, it's true that, you know, it is, the people have been overwhelmed by pain, that they can see their, their loved ones burned or killed and butchered like, 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 like an animal, you know. So it's, it's, it's really painful. I have talked to people who know people there, who know, who can call, these are my family members, this is my cousin who has been killed with her children. Mm. I have talked with people who have children there, who know, who have family there. And it is very painful to hear that, very painful. It's not she in your humble opinion, what therapy? can take Cameroon out of this problem? Uh, the first thing that, the more this matter prolongs, the more it becomes complicated to look for a solution. I think, I think there has been no situation where war, where arms, where killings, where fighting has solved the problem. The one thing is that we must sit down on, in, on a, experience yourselves. At the end of the day, the parties that are war will sit down on the table and have to frankly and honestly dialogue for the good of the common man. If that is not done, the, the war will continue. At the end of the day, whatever it takes, the, they will have to come down and sit on the talking table. The sooner the better. The sooner the better. What happened in Yaoundé, the national dialogue? It was, it was not, some, it people was say it was a monologue. Because some of the key artisans of this war were absent. They were absent. So whatever it takes to bring the, whoever is behind the scenes and telegating the war, they must sit down. Whether they are the, whoever it is, whatever it takes, it has to be done. There are no two ways about it. Yeah, there was a, there were a sprinkling of few people who were present in Yaoundé. I was present in Yaoundé and I want to say that. But because I was present, because I think we want to do anything that will bring about a solution, the peace that we so badly long. Because we are living there on the ground and we see 
what the people have suffered and are suffering. I've seen the destruction. It will take me 50 years to rebuild Kumbo to be where it is, uh, where it is at the moment. It's so you took part in the major national dialogue. I was, and, I was. And, and it came out with uh, the special status. Uh, special status. Can yeah, you solve uh, the problem? The special status. What is the content of special status? The people don't say that. Not it's not. You cannot come out. What is the content of special? Is it a taboo thing to discuss? Is it hidden? At the end of the day, we must bring who, all the parties to a talking table and a dialogue so that we can see how do we move ahead. At the end of the day, that's a concern. All right. Do you have a message for your people in the Kumbu diocese in Anglophone Cameroon uh, and the country as well? My message to our people is that. Enough is enough. They must end this killing. Whoever is involved, we have lost life. Cameroon has a bad name. And this war should not continue. So whatever it takes to bring an end to the war should be taken. And it means sitting on the table, even with their enemies, and talk for the good of the people. If they love the people that they are fighting for, that they, that they claim to be representing, that they claim to be ruling. Anybody who has any way to go about it, we must drop our pride, our ideas, our ways, and peace can only reign when those people who love the people and the self can sit down for the good of the people, for our people's good. I say, let us drop our weapons and talk for the good of our people, not for our own selfish personal interests. His Lordship George Kuh, Bishop of Kumbu Diocese in the northwest region of the country. Thanks for accepting to join us in this edition of The Insight. You're most welcome. Thank you very much. It's my pleasure. Thanks, ladies and gentlemen, for staying with us in some few seconds. Meet our third guest. Our third guest in this edition of The Inside is His Grace Andrew Kia, Archbishop of the Baminda Diocese of the, the Baminda Archdiocese of the Roman Catholic Church. He took over from His Grace uh, Archbishop Fornelius Contem. It was Saturday. You're welcome, His Grace. Thank you very much. Thank you. Saturday was quite a busy and uh, tough day. Yes, I think it was. Thanks be to God. And you've taken over the baton of command of the Bamenda Archdiocese of the Roman Catholic Church from your predecessor who served for 37 years, serving man, serving God, and you're taking over uh, the button of command from him. What are some of the things that are on your shoulders, on your mind, as you take over now? Um, I think, uh, first and foremost, uh, becoming an Archbishop is not something that anybody merits. Uh, it's a choice from God. I was appointed by the Holy Father, Pope Francis, I don't know exactly why he chose me, but God must have a reason. And I just have to open myself to his will and through the spirit of discernment, know what God wants me to do in Bamenda. I'm coming to Bamenda at a very difficult time, a time when the socio-political crisis has hit the whole ecclesiastical province of Bamenda. We have seen a lot of suffering. We have seen a lot of killing violence and I think the challenge I have in front of me primordially is to see how we can galvanize our people and our efforts to see that we come back to a peaceful atmosphere. We are tired of war, we, have tired, we are tired of running in the bushes. We think that peace should come back and above all like I said my first task here with this challenge in front of me is to rely on the gospel, the word of God. The second challenge, walk. The second uh, responsibility, preach the gospel. The third responsibility, preach the gospel. It's only through the gospel that we can permeate all the spheres of society. And like my motto says, the motto of my Episcopal ordination, in spirit and in truth. Therefore, whatever we do in this archdiocese, we do it guided by the Holy Spirit and for the truth and only the truth. All right. The church today is uh, in a kind of battle or conflict of figures with the administration. The 
conflict of facts with the administration as far as some happenings in the country, notably in the Anglophone parts of the country is concerned. But there are some allegations that the church has been too close to the administration. At every, have you at any given point in time of your service in Manfe, uh, before coming here, uh, had some kind of pressure from the administration, some kind of influence from the administration to say this, not to say that, to do this, not to do that? No, I think uh, the administration is wiser than that. Uh, they will not ask you what to say or what not to say. But they will say what they want to say, even if it contradicts what you are saying. So I don't think I've ever had anybody pressuring me to say what I would not want to say. But I've also had situations where some other voices contradicted mine. But I was saying what I saw on the ground. I don't know from where other, they got their own facts, but I was saying what I saw on the ground because I was there. So I don't think uh, anybody puts me under pressure. But one thing I have to make all your listeners to understand is that my first responsibility is a pastor. My first calling, my vocation is to be a pastor. And as a pastor, I reach out to everybody. There is no uh, rejection of anybody who is open to listening to the gospel. And I can enter anywhere for the sake of Christ who called me to, the, to his service. And therefore, politicians are our Christians. Uh, Amber boys are our Christians. They are part of our flock. The hoi polloi, the general people of God, are our Christians. And so we must be able to courageously reach out to all spheres, anywhere, administration, military, the secessionists or separatists or liberalists or uh, moderates. The church is supposed to reach out to everybody. And our principal duty, reaching out to everybody, is to preach reconciliation and peace. Peace that is supported by justice. All right. You served for some number of years in the Manfrey Diocese as bishop. What's been happening in the Diocese of Manfrey since 2016, late 2016, when the crisis started? A lot of things have been happening. And uh, to be honest with you, the violent part of this socio-political crisis started in Manfrey. It was in Manfrey that the violence escalated. And I remember that in 2017, towards the end of 2017, Kumbu Diocese contributed food and money to send to help refugees and internally displaced in Manfrey. Bamenda Ice Diocese did the same, Buya Diocese did the same, and some other dioceses uh, in, our, in the Francophone zone, they did the same. But you see, the crisis later spread and went everywhere. Now, Manfe Diocese constitutes or is comprised of the territorial circumscription, administrative circumscription of Manu Division, Libya Lem Division, and Guti Subdivision in Kupe Maneguba Division. So, in all these three areas, these three divisions, the dynamics are different. Uh, I last went to Libyalem on the 1st of April 2018 and since then I've never set foot there because that seems to be the center of the resistance and it has been very very difficult. I closed practically all the parishes in that area but in the plain of Manu things have greatly improved. Uh, in Manu we see uh, life coming back to normal, some of the, uh, uh, the internally displaced coming back, except in those villages where houses were burnt. Of course, they have nowhere to go to. Uh, so they are still staying out with their relatives and their friends. But I think there's relative calm in Manu, Manu Central. Uh, but Libyalem is still very tough. Nguti, there is also relative calm. You see, we have gone through a lot. We have suffered a lot. We have seen a lot of killing. 
We have seen kidnapping. We have seen torture. And uh, all along, we have to condemn what is not right. Killing whoever is doing it is wrong. And so this is our work. We have seen all this in Manfi, but thanks be to God, we are seeing uh, some light at the end of the tunnel, at least in Manfi Central. Concerning the killings, concerning the burning down of houses, the destruction that has been going on in that part of the southwest region of the country, or those parts of the southwest region of the country, the Manual Division, the LBLM Division, who has been doing what? His Grace. Uh, no, I think, uh, you see, it's a, it's a mixed thing. Uh, villages and uh, houses of uh, separatists are princ principally burnt down by military. Uh, the government institutions and schools are attacked and burnt down by separatists. So that is a, it's, it's, it's a double, it's a two-way traffic. Uh, once the Amber Boys sit down and classify you as a black leg, they burn your house. You become a target. They, you become a target. They have a way to kill you. Once the military are certain that Amber Boys run out of your house with arms, they'll burn down the house. So this is a clear thing that we are witnessing every day. So it depends on where the killing or the burning is coming from. We know who is doing it. In some of the villages, for example, Kwakwa, in completely... Kwakwa in Kumba Diocese, uh, I only heard that from the bishop. Uh, but you know, the first uh, village that was raised down was uh, Kembong in the Manu Division, in the Yumujok Subdivision. And uh, there was definitely the military, was, there's no gainsay. But the military did that after the Amber Boys came and attacked them and killed four of their colleagues. Then they came out in rampage against the village. And uh, we saw, that is when we got the first internally displaced people and the first refugees running out. So this is the situation. Though the allegations against the military concerning the killings and the destruction have been constantly rejected by the administration, that has mm. maintained that the military is professional and has been doing its job uh, respecting human life, respecting the laws of the land and even international laws and so on. You see, my brother, uh, it's not true. Even in the priesthood, we have bad priests. In the bishopric, you have bad bishops. So how can military be perfect? How? Oh, we should be serious. <laughs> there must be bad elements who do things that government does not want. So we cannot, you cannot say military is professional. Professional how? There are no bad elements in, so it's a perfect military, then it is not human. It's not human. But if I talk about human situation, there are seats inside who do things which maybe government does not want. They will loot. We have facts where they have looted. That's, maybe they were not sent to loot, but they looted. So to say that they are professional, they are perfect, is an overstatement. In every profession, journalists, they are bad journalists. So let's not go that far, that route. Maybe right. politics is different from, from theology. Right. <laughs> well, what has been the rate of the uh, atrocities being committed in uh, the Manfred diocese where you were? and by extrapolation to the rest of the southwest region of the country? Uh, I think uh, because of the social media, you get a lot of reports which cannot be verified. But I can only talk about what I know. And I think uh, the damaging effects have been unimaginable. If you look at, for example, the people who have run away from their villages, they are refugees in Nigeria. I've been to Nigeria at least five to six times, six times, uh, to visit the refugee camps. And I've seen some of the appalling conditions in which our Cameroonian brothers and sisters live. And I've advised some to actually come home. And I said to them, if you don't know where to go, come to my house. I'll put you in a hall 
and at least you'll be better there than sleeping under bridges and on people's verandas in Nigeria. I've seen very bad conditions there. And uh, the characters in my diocese also visits the bush, some of the places where the people have been hiding. And uh, we have been appealing also to the military. And I think that uh, my SDO in Manu uh, and his uh, Etat Major have been collaborating in what we have been, we have been working together. And one of the things I say in our effort to bring peace, the people can listen to us as pastors. We can convince them to come out of the bushes back into their homes. But we are also begging the military on the other side not to attack them. Because you scatter, you undo the effort that we are trying to do. We are preaching peace to the people and trying to make sure that they come back. The government should collaborate with us, this, especially the forces of law and order. They should collaborate with us that we don't bring the people back for them to send them away again. Uh, In they, your opinion, yeah. Ms. Grace, what is the solution to this problem now? Uh, the solution to this problem is for us to continue dialoguing in truth and sincerity. Uh, we went for the major national dialogue and uh, we are awaiting the implementation of some of the resolutions of the, special of, status? Of the, the, the dialogue. Special status have been declared, but we are not talking about declarations, we are talking about implementation. Once we start implementing things, for the people to see that things are changing, their life is getting better, things will, cease, will, will calm down. But if we remain at the level of theory and declarations, who believes who these days? We want action. Time for speaking is over. So we we'll believe in these things, but the people are also waiting to see some concrete actions, concrete on, the actions on the ground. Can the implementation of the spatial status uh, open the way out? Yes, I tell you something. I've told many people that uh, special status can take us very far, as much as it can take us nowhere. Let us start implementing it. Let nobody say that special status will not work. And let nobody say that special status is the solution. Let us start implementing special status. We may see that that is the solution of our problem. That can calm down our people. We may start implementing it and see that it's not working. We go back to the draft board and we say that the special status thing is not working. But we cannot just reject it from the first day, it will not work. I am an optimist in the sense that I open up to try things before it fails. You come and tell me, move one step, I'll move. If my one step is not sufficient, we dialogue again. Right. Do you have a message for the people of the Bamenda uh, Archdiocese. Archdiocese that you're going yeah. to be leading henceforth and the people of the ecclesiastical, the province. Cameroon, yeah. the ecclesiastical province in general and the nation as a whole. Yes, I think uh, my message has been consistent from the very first day. Uh, there is no Cameroonian who is a foreigner. Every Cameroonian is a Cameroonian, and we should relate as such. And in this way, we should be able to live like brothers and sisters, based on the human principles of justice, of love, of equality, and of peace. And uh, if we do this, I'm telling you that you will see a new Cameroon, a different Cameroon. And so I'm calling on all the people who are listening to me that, to understand that we can achieve a lot with peace. We can lose so much with war. I believe in activism, but I don't believe in violence. I believe that we can shout and make our voices heard, but you don't call attention by killing people or burning down houses. My appeal from the time I was in Manfe until now, come to Bamenda, is that we need peace. We should go on our knees and pray for peace. Because in the kind of chaotic situation in which we are living now in this uh, part of the country, there is so much that people are doing against each other, which has nothing to do with 
the fight or the struggle. Some people now just use the situation to settle their scores. And uh, some people use it, arm robbers are using it as a way of now getting their money. And uh, unscrupulous individuals are benefiting from the blood of others. I think we need peace. Let us give peace a chance. Peace does not mean the end of the struggle for justice. Peace means changing our methods and changing our tactics. We must work for peace. I believe in this from the bottom of my heart. We must and this work is my message. For peace. We must work for peace. We must work for peace. His Grace Andrew Kia, Archbishop of Bamenda. Thanks. Thank you very much, Mr. Babila. The inside. Thank you. God bless you. Thanks, ladies and gentlemen, for staying with us. That's it for today.